My God is with me day and night. He will never leave me nor forsake me. And I need to remember that when I walk in faith because I'm filtering it only through my experience. I'm living the lower life. I'm living the human life. I'm living what God doesn't really want for me. I will not set my agenda by the world. I will not let the world tell me who I should be. I will not let the world tell me what I am. I will not let the world tell me where I'm going. I will not let the world tell me what I'm supposed to watch. I will stand by the Word of God and when I do, I filter it through the Word of God and that power and that anointing guides me more than what the world tells me. I want to get back on and I, I said to the first service I'll just go ahead and say it again I don't apologize I've been on this message I've been on the the series for the armor of God for the last three months but I just can't seem God will not just release me from talking about this how many of you know there's so much to pull out of those verses so much to bring into our life and speak into our life that we need to understand that what I'm about to talk about today, which is a, the shield of faith, it's very visible here. But the word tells us that it fights off the fiery darts. It fights off the things that try to come into our life that oppress us, bring sickness into our life, bring doubt, bring unbelief. All those things are fiery darts. And the word faith is the ability, the shield, the anointing to be able to stop those things from coming in. Now where do they attack? Uh, I think I would be miscued you to not let you know that where they're fired at is not necessarily your heart first, they're fired at your mind. And the reason they are is because the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation are so tied in, in fact let me read this to you again. We've been talking that we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness. People are not your problem, regardless of what you think you're going through. It's really attacks from the enemy that try to bombard our minds. And I have learned one thing as a Christian, that if I do not learn to renew my mind to the Word of God, to his power, what the cross did for me, what the blood does for me, then what begins to happen is I filter things through my mind by my experiences, rather than filtering them through the Word of God. And so we really miss it because faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the things not seen is what faith says. So therefore, if I filter only what's happening in my life through my mind and I rely only on my experiences or maybe my disappointments or maybe my hurts because how many of you know that's what most of us focus on we don't focus on the good things that have happened in our life we focus on the negative things can I get an amen? amen. Praise God. Look at your neighbor and say he likes amens <laughs> just say that hallelujah okay good now that we're engaged um, because if we don't really understand this, if we don't connect with that, if we don't recognize that the real battle is in the spirit, when we filter things through our own mind or our own eyes of what we see, then we begin to draw on our own understanding and our own ability. And how many of you realize the word says, do not lean on your own understanding? Yeah. In all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. So if we begin to not lean on our understanding, then we have an understanding we can lean on and it's called the word of God. And then we find God's will, God's purpose, God's plan, who we are. All of these things begin to manifest themselves to us. So with that being said, we've been talking about Ephesians 6. It goes, therefore take on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in that evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girdled your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having your, your 
having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now I want you to look at something because I've covered those three things. But I've never noticed this in all these times, or I have uh, noted, I've read it because I read it in its entirety. But I want to show you something. There is a shift here in the scripture. Because the next words, after it says peace, it says, above all, take on. That's right. <laughs> now that's an amazing thing when you look at this, because Paul is saying the three things I've talked to you about first they're important, they're powerful, they're all part of the armor. But now he's saying, above all. Amen. When God says that in his word, how many of you know, there is a shift taking place from one thing to another. Yes. And what he's saying now is he's giving us the last three pieces of the armor. Now it all fits together, but he says, above all, take on the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. In other words, as we break this down now over the next few weeks, by faith we walk, by faith we anointed, by faith we got saved. There is a power of fighting off fiery darts with faith. With the helmet of salvation, how many of you know your salvation does more for you than just get you saved? So many times people never speak of salvation after they get saved because they feel they're saved and they're set free and they're liberated and they're born again and all that's important. But your salvation brought things into your life that you couldn't get any other way. Amen. And nobody talks much about that. Right. But we need to recognize it's a helmet. Salvation actually protects your mind yes. from the things that are trying to come into it. Amen. And then the sword of the Spirit is the only offensive weapon that we have. It's the Word of God is what it says. And how many of you realize it will shred anything that is not of God because you test everything by the Word of God. And therefore if it doesn't line up to the Word of God, it kicks that out or rejects it or slices it. It's a two-edged sword, the Word said, cutting and discerning even the thought and the intent of the heart. And it's very important, it works as good for you as it does destroy the enemy. Because what it does is it brings an intention into your mind that you may fight with the shield of faith to fire those fiery darts that are trying to come in. Which really, what are the fiery darts? Let's begin there. Number one, the fiery darts are unbelief. It wants to take your love life that you have for God. It wants to rack your body. It wants to destroy your mind because the enemy has one thought and that is to get in your head because if he can get in your head, the body will soon follow. I'm preaching better than y'all are amen. amen. Because all things start with our thoughts. Most everything that happens to us. It's when we get unappreciative of either the person God's gave us or what the Lord has led us through or how God's delivered us and we forget those things and then we start reminiscing on the things that we've been hurt or disappointed about or feelings we have and how many of you know when you begin to see life through those eyes you filter it through your experience if all you do is see them in your mind and you don't see it in your spirit where we do our battle you can't fight the enemy can I get an amen? amen? So with that being said, let's look at this. It says, above all, take on the shield of faith. Everybody say the shield of faith. Shield of faith. So first of all, we talked a little bit about this, but we talked about what is the shield. The shield is to fight off the fiery darts. It covers the organs of the body. In fact, the definition of shield is this. The part of the armor that protects, covers, shields, and stops danger. Does anybody need that in their life? No. Come on, church. And then it goes on to say, the shield of faith will fight off sickness, poverty, fear, and unbelief. Those are the fiery darts because those things masticize, if you will, even in our life. They take root like cancer in our mind and what they do is they begin to masticize and the next thing you know, those thoughts are greater than God's thoughts in your heart. 
and they will even begin to grow in your life if you do not fight them off. If you do not keep them out, what will happen in our lives is the thoughts of God are trying to take over, but they can't get through. Come on, church. Are you with me? Because you have to really fight this. You are in a battle, not for your life. You know where you're going to spend eternity. You're in a battle for your mind right now. On this earth, that's really what the enemy wants to fight. And his entire agenda is to get in your head and get unbelief, fear, doubt, worry right. into your head. And then when he gets it in your head, your body will fall along when your battle is really in the spirit. And the spirit is saying, those things can change. I have a spiritual life for you. You can no longer have to look at things just through your natural abilities. Now I've given you the word of God and you know how to be directed. But if you don't let the Word of God take preeminence over that, and you don't renew your mind, one of the scriptures basically says this, and when we get to the helmet of salvation, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, I'm fired up a little bit. I kind of look at your neighbor and say, hallelujah, or something. <laughs> i got to catch my breath here, because I'm really kind of fired up about this, because I see so many people that are in the body of Christ that are defeated, yeah. not because they don't have the victory, but because they let their mind and they let their eyes rule everything and when they do they filter that through instead of you know faith is the evidence of things not seen God describes to us what the shield of faith really is you can't see it with your natural eye but you have a spiritual eye that can see that and can tell you and it will follow the Word of God the more pre prevalent it becomes in your life the word and you give yourself over to God's will what begins to happen is then you no longer filter things through the natural means of this world you now filter them through the spirit and the word of God which is eternal and so therefore when something happens or a thought comes in or a circumstance happens you're no longer you're recognizing that you're no longer fighting that in the natural realm you need to go to the spiritual realm and deal with that and then it will affect the natural realm Amen. and when that and a lot of people that's hard for us to understand what we don't understand listen to me listen to me church very carefully all people are looking for spiritual things this is why seances, even the dark side, people are seeking after Buddha, seek, people are seeking after something, people yoga, empty your mind. God doesn't say empty your mind, God says fill your mind. There's a big difference. If you empty your mind, the enemy's going to fill your mind. In Proverbs, or in Psalms 1, it says, renew, they that meditate on the Lord shall renew their strength. They that meditate on the word will be like the tree planted by the river. You have, meditation is not bad. What's bad is the way the world teaches meditation is to empty your mind. God's way says, they that focus on my word. In fact, let me just read that to you. Is that okay? I'm going to go off script here, which I don't really stay much on script anyway. But. Amen. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinner, nor sets in the seat of the scornful. Now what's he describing to us? He's saying, don't be like the world. Don't let the world set your agenda, because it's a negative world we live in. It's been under a curse since the fall of Adam and Eve. And there is a curse on the world, and the way they think, the way they do things, the way they say, and what is accepted. He is saying, don't set in that seat. In the New Testament it says, Renew your mind. Do not be transformed or be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not like the world. Another scripture says, don't let the world form you or develop you into their ways. Come on, church. This is so real. I mean, this is maybe a little deep, but you have to understand this is where we live. And then he doesn't stop there, nor set in the seat of the scornful, but he delights in the law of the Lord. And what's he saying? You delight in the Word. The Word gives you the direction. David also says it in this very book. He goes on to say, The Word is a lamp unto my feet that I may not stumble. Amen. Right. 
He's saying it gives me light in a dark world. It shows me how to go. It shows me where to walk. It tells me how to operate. It tells me what I need to do. But I can't just do it in the natural. I have to begin in the spirit and let it overflow into the natural. Amen. But delights in the law of the Lord and then does he meditate day and night. Now, meditation, what did he just tell us? He told us meditation is good, but you fill your mind with the Word of God. Diligently meditate day and night on the Word. What the world tells us, or what yoga, and why yoga is a little dangerous, is because it tells you to empty yourself. God tells you to fill yourself and push all that other stuff out. Because if you empty your mind, I guarantee you the enemy will fill it. You, God doesn't tell us to empty our mind. God tells us to fill our mind. And then when our mind process begins to happen, when we see things happening in the natural, we can filter it now through the Word of God because we know it. Come on, are you there? And what happens is when you filter it through the Word of God, you find the will of God, the purpose of God, the plan of God. All of these things begin to get revealed to us. But if you don't filter it through the Word of God and you filter it through your natural eyes, you can only filter it through your experiences about not leaning on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all His ways and then that will direct your path. But your path can't be directed until you give it over to the Word of God. And look at the promise we have. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, who brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever his hands find to do shall prosper. Amen. Wow, what a promise. Come on, church. Uh, what? If we don't set in the seat of the scornful, we don't act like the world, we're not formed into the world system, we meditate day and night on the Word of God, and then we're like a tree planted yes. by the rivers of water that brings forth what? Fruit. fruit. Everybody say, you're a fruit bearer. I didn't say you were fruity, I said you're a fruit bearer. Because I've known a few flakes, fruits, and nuts. How about you? But you're actually bearing fruit, which it talks about in the New Testament, uh, out of the spirit realm, and then whatever your hands find to do. Come on. Everybody say, I'm ready. Amen. I mean, that's that prosperous. Why? As your soul prospers. The word says, above all, I wish you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Yes. So remember he dealt first of all with a dark world, a negative world. Then he dealt with what we can meditate on, what we need to put our heart to, our mind to, our eye gates to. And then he says that prosperity comes. How many of you know many people want to leave the process out and just get to the last part of the verse? <laughs> but if you don't do that, if you don't process it in a way, it's not a shield. It won't block those fiery darts. So with that being said, when is God our shield? He's our shield, number one, when we begin to understand the power of trust. Everybody say trust. When you trust God, go ahead and put the scriptures up there if you would, please. Um, it's really, really important. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in Him and He is my help. Everybody say, God's my answer. God's the answer. You know, when those fiery darts come, when those things happen, the shield is up, the power is there. It also says, every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in Him. So in other words, if you have your trust in your checking account, you have, you know, I mean, don't misunderstand me. Um, anybody see the movie Jerry Maguire? Remember the movie? And he walks in and says, you know, you complete me. No, God completes me. I love Pastor Sandy. She is one with me. I am one with her. But I can't be completed by any person. I can only be completed by God. And so when I get saved, I say, God, you complete me. Because you tell me you're my shield. Every word that is in the Word of God is my promise. 
and my hope in him. So we need to really understand that. Oh, we also trust in the Lord. Put the next slide up there, please. Um, when we have an anointing of God to bring forth, that's what you get for using these silly equipment here. Okay. Let me do this. Everybody say, I love pastor. Let's start over here. There we go. Hallelujah. God is my shield when I trust. How many of you know God is your shield also when you sing songs? I talked about this a few weeks ago, but it's important maybe to reiterate on it. How many of you know you don't have to praise, you get to praise? I said you get to praise. Come on, can I get a praise in this house? How many? Yeah, that's right. You don't have to praise, you get to praise. And that's where most people miss it. God becomes your shield when you praise. He's your anointing. He promised, therefore, my heart is greatly rejoiced, and I sing, and I will praise him. Then we talked about how many of you know God is your shield when you wait on him. <laughs> Tap your neighbor and say, patience. <laughs> Look on the other side and say, I need some of that. <laughs> patience is something that we're not very good at at times. Come on, church. I mean, we want, you know, we, what did I say last time? Somebody told me, I said, you know, we, we live in a microwave world when God is a crock pot lover. <laughs> I mean, you know, we really, <laughs> it's so true in our life because, you know, we want the microwave God, but God is like the crock pot. I mean, sometimes his timing isn't our timing, amen? And we just need to wait on him and he becomes that power and that anointing. And so then what is faith? Faith is trust without doubt or question. Everybody say without doubt or question. Boy, Julie was spot on, Pastor Julie this morning when she was leading worship. That last song, all of us, uh, even pastors, we all try to have doubt come in our life. Try to have confusion come in. But how many of you realize that if that's the case and it happens to all of us, there's nobody in here that ever hasn't doubted something. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if we're going to fight fear and doubt, we've got to fight it then with faith. Mm -hmm. Dick Burnell taught me a long time ago in spiritual... When I was in Russia, I taught on spiritual warfare. And man, those people, they are hungry about that. Just the title. The first time I taught, I taught five different times in a day session, and then three times in an afternoon session, and in two night sessions there. We were there for, I believe, ten days, and we were in Moscow first, and when we got to Moscow, it was mainly teenagers, young people, college age, because a lot of the older people were already set in their ways. But the young people are buying into Christianity by the millions there. And we were in an auditorium that probably seated 5,000, maybe 6,000 people. And there was standing room only. When we gave Bibles away the first night, they had to really stop the crowd because they were pushing us up against the... There was no tables. We just had stacks of Bibles. And we were down, and then there was a large stage. It was about three more steps up than this. They were pressing in so bad, they wanted a Bible, and most of us have five of them. Yeah. Right. But that's how bad they wanted Bibles. And I remember the first day I taught, I had this young girl interpreter. Uh, they use a lot of young people, because they're the only ones that speak English in college, and so a lot of them are college kids, and some of them aren't even saved. My, the girl that interpreted for me, a Calvary Chapel pastor had been there before me, and he said, you want that girl? She really did a great job for me. So I asked her, would she be my interpreter? And she was like about my girl's age back then. This was a few years back, and she was so sweet. And let me tell you what happened. I, uh, I spoke on spiritual warfare the first day. I couldn't get in the room. This is the truth. I could not get in the room. I had to stand in the doorway, and there was 100 people outside and I said to them I'll be teaching tomorrow come back again tomorrow no no we won't we don't want to leave so I taught it literally in the doorway in a both direction room wow. 
That's how bad they want to know about spiritual warfare. The next day, they moved me to a larger room that seated about 300 more people. I couldn't get in that room. <laughs> By the fifth day, I was in the big auditorium because they wanted to know about spiritual warfare. They wanted to know what was happening through God in the spirit. And they had been walking in fear. And what I started this off with is Dick taught me this. If you're ever going to break a spiritual problem, you've got to fight it with a spiritual substance. And the opposite of fear is faith. You can't be in fear and faith at the same time. Because of the way fear and faith is described. I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and what? A sound mind. So therefore, you can't be in both camps at the same time. So you have to choose where you're going to be. Well, I taught that in Russia. I taught that in Russia. And the last day, I was in Moscow before we left to Kiev. This young interpreter, I'd say she was probably about 20, 19 years old. She said, can I talk to you? I have something I want to tell you. And one of the things they did is they prepped us when we went there and it said, if you have an interpreter, don't be alone with them. Don't meet with them in a room or somewhere by themselves. So I told her, yeah, I'll talk to you, but I would like to meet you in the lobby of the hotel. And so she came to the lobby and this is what she told me. Now listen to me very carefully because this will blow some of your mind. She said, and that first day I met her, we, we didn't teach, we just gave them our notes so they could be ready to teach when we, we were as an interpreter. So she sat down and she said, you know, when you gave me the notes on spiritual warfare, I didn't know if I really believed all that stuff you had on the paper. But after that first time you taught that, she said, I went back to my room and I had a dream. And I said, oh, really? And she said, I come from a village about 18 hours from Moscow on the other side of Russia. I rode a train to get here to go to college. And this is what she said. In the dream, she said, I was in my village and there was a dragon flying over my village spewing fire. And everybody was running in panic and fear. And she said, when you read that scripture, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. In my dream, out of all of us in the village running, I stopped and turned around. And when I did, it was like the spirit she didn't say a sword, but I had taught on this scripture. And she said, God put a spear in my hand and I thrust it at the dragon and it fell dead on the ground. Amen. And she, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps even telling the story. And she said, I can't wait to get back to my village. Thousands of people are going to get saved. Church, I want to tell you, we live in a time, everybody's seeking for spiritual things, but many of them are looking in the wrong place. Their ladder is leaned on the wrong wall. God is our source. God is our power. God is our faith. We don't have to fear any longer. Say, I will not fear. I am a child of God. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a praise clap in this house. Now what I want to talk to you about is, is really faith is trust also. It's where you won't doubt. Number two, this is where we're going to pick up. Faith also has the power or should allow us to not doubt. Everybody say no doubt. No doubt. Now it's not, doesn't mean doubt won't why to try to come in. But we have to, it says, lean not on your own understanding. Corinthians says that your faith should be in the wisdom, not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power 
of God. Put that scripture up there. Look at this. Read it with me, in fact. Without doubt or question. Go ahead, one more. Who's, who's doing it? Oh, Pastor Sandy, sorry. I'm used to Pastor Mike being here. Don't we appreciate Pastor Sandy? Hallelujah today. But look at look at this. Look look at this scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 5. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men. You know, I love you and I really try to do the best I can with God. But look, I can disappoint you. I'm not perfect. But my God is. Don't put your trust in people. I don't mean that bad. I've done it. We've probably all done it. People can hurt you. People can wound you. But guess what? God will never disappoint you. He'll never give you, the word says, more than you can bear. And you have to stand on that. It doesn't, he didn't say he would never have anything bad happen. He just said, I'll give you the strength if you'll walk in me. I'll do spiritual warfare with you. I will break fear off your life. If you will let me be your source. If you will let me complete you. If you will be in my word and meditate on that day and night, you will prosper. And whatever your hands find to do, it shall turn to good for that which the enemy meant for bad. I think sometimes we need to hear that more than we do. Because for some reason the mind has a tendency to remember the things that happened wrong to us instead of the good things that have happened to us. And so we're still filtering things, if you will, through our own experience. When we need to be filtering things through the power and the Word of God. And when you filter them through that, you find out who God really is. And then even though there is a disappointment, even though there is a letdown, even though some, come on church, are you there? Because he, all of us go through things. But guess what? Things don't have to rule our life. Amen. Things don't have to set the agenda of how I feel when I get up tomorrow morning. My God is with me day and night. He will never leave me nor forsake me. And I need to remember that when I walk in faith because I'm filtering it only through my experience. I'm living the lower life. I'm living the human life. I'm living what God doesn't really want for me. I will not set my agenda by the world. I will not let the world tell me who I should be. I will not let the world tell me what I am. I will not let the world tell me where I'm going. I will not let the world tell me what I'm supposed to watch. I will stand by the Word of God and when I do, I filter it through the Word of God and that power and that anointing guides me more than what the world tells me. Amen. But if we don't do that, what... Have you guys... I think so often we get so desensitized because TV, government, even society tries to tell us what we should be accepting. Now I'm going to preach at you here a minute. And what they're trying to do, do you, do you know what they do to elephants in the carnivals? They take them as a small baby elephant and they drive a stake in the ground and they chain that elephant to that stake. And for the first few days that elephant will try to pull it out and try to get away but he's not strong enough yet. He's still a baby. And after a few weeks of that, he stops pulling on the stake. Now the years go by and now he's a full grown bull elephant weighing over a ton. He could pull that stake out with just one pull of his leg. But do you know, as long as they put that chain around that same leg, he won't even pull that out. Because he's so patterned. Come on church. He is so patterned to when the chain's on that leg, he's staked down and he can't go any further than that chain. How many humans have been staked out 
and have been geared, well, well, I come from a family that's like this. They're all dysfunctional, and I come from a family that always has a temper, and I come. Well, guess what? You've got a new family today. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you don't have to lean. In fact, when I'm done with this series, I'm going to start a series called Breaking Generational Curses. Because people have to learn how to break that stuff off your life. If you don't learn that, you will. Have you ever stood in front of the mirror and say, I don't ever want to be like my parents, and all of a sudden one of them's looking at you back? <laughs> it's scary to me, man. I mean, it's like, holy mackerel. My dad's out of the grave. And there's a few times I have acted like him. And I said, I never would. How many of us have been staked out since we were a kid and we now have the power of God. We could pull that stake out and go anywhere we wanted for God and do whatever we can do for God. But because we were so patterned back there, we're still staked to that ground. Isn't it time you pull that stake out? Isn't it time you begin to walk by faith and not by sight? Isn't it time you quit filtering everything through your natural experiences and experience? Instead of standing on the world side, isn't it time to get in the God-mindedness? Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. If, he, if that was not possible, he would not have told us that. God will never tell you to do anything that's impossible. He's not like that. We can do it if we put our mind up to it. Look at your neighbor say, he's preaching to me right now. Just tell him that. Because it's your mind that keeps you back. Nothing else. Not your experience. Not what your feelings are. Not how the day is gone or the week is gone. It's your choice. It's my choice. I can either choose to live God's way or I can lean on my own understanding and filter everything that comes into my life by my experience. And how many of you know when we do that, we let the world mold us into keeping that stake in the ground. The Word says, the Spirit has made us free. Don't be entangled again to the yoke of bondage. Let's pull some stakes this morning. Amen? Amen. Did you get anything out of that this morning? See, if we'll recognize that, and that alone right there, it would liberate us in this place. Your marriage can be better than it's ever been. Finances, God can give you wisdom. I want to tell you openly, this, this might sound a little braggadocious, but it's true. I, I, I do some investments, small, because I don't make a lot of money. I make less money now than I did when I was 30 years old. But do you know I have more money in the bank? And it seems like, first year I did a financial class, I always watched silver. I was in a silver and gold business years ago. I had a, a business called West Coast uh, Silver Company. and. Um, I've always kind of, it's, it's a poor man's gold, and I'm not telling you to do this, I'm just saying. And so, you know, silver was down to about 12 bucks an ounce. And so I went out, I had a little money from Christmas and stuff, and I went out and I bought me a few ounces of silver. Do you know what silver was closing Friday? Over $20 an ounce in six months. It has went up almost 80%. 80%. Don't tell me God can't show you things. Yeah. I pray about things that I do. Yes. Now, I'm not saying to be foolish and go do something because I've had people, you know, it's kind of like tithing. You have tithers' rights. And if you tithe and you give to God, you can claim your tithers' rights. And you, you can be blessed. I want to tell you. It's people say, well, I can't afford to tithe. You can't afford not to tithe. <laughs> I am telling you the truth. Because when you tithe, you handle money differently completely. When you put God first, He's going to add. And 
it's an amazing thing. I've always claimed tithers rights. When I make an investment, I say I'm a tither. I believe it's going to come back to me. I know. Now a lot of people don't confess that. But I think God, I, I just read you in Psalms. That's my faith. A man prophesied that over me when I was two months old in the Lord. He gave me that scripture. I have stood on that scripture throughout all my business adventures, building this church, doing everything I've done, I've stood on that scripture. I have that scripture in my office, in a frame. Okay, that's right. So I remember it. Because whatsoever my hand, God has promised me, whatsoever my hands do will prosper if I put him first. Yep. If I don't stand in the scornful way, if I don't sit in the seat of the world, if I let him, whoo, you guys are pulling on me here. Because I want to tell you, it can be a good life. But you've got to learn how to get a, out of filtering it through your own natural experience. Faith is the evidence of things not seen, the substance. Just place your hands on your eyes. Let's do that this morning. Say with me, Jesus, I refuse to no longer live by what I see. Your word will guide my heart, my steps, my thoughts. I will prosper in all things for your glory. I put you first and I refuse to give in to a dying world in the name of Jesus. Now give the Lord a praise clap in this house like you mean it. Because if you'll put God first, I want to tell you there's nothing he won't do. Did I say life would be perfect? No. You will go. It rains on the just and it rains on the unjust. But the rain isn't what determines. It's how you handle the rain. It's what you do with the rain. If you don't let the rain soak your life and shake it off. We were just up at the lake here in the last week and we had three dogs with us. None of them were mine. <laughs> but Shelly and Do John has just got a new little dog. It's a puppy still. And it's a husky kind of mixed dog. Looks like a wolf to Ruthley. And Aaron and Stephanie had their dogs there and they just jumped in the water and swam around. And, and this poor husky, which you would have thought, you know, he would get in the water and of course he would come over and stand by me and then shake off. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? It was like I was his magnet or something. I don't know what was going on. But I would move and he would still find me. <laughs> but you got to shake some things off in your life. Come on church. Isn't it time to shake it off and live what God says? Yeah. I want to tell you, I guess, because I'm your pastor, most of you are here, few visitors, I know it's summer and people are coming and going, but listen, I love you enough to know the power that you can live under. Amen. It started with me with a young age and I didn't even understand what was going on. But I want to tell you, God is good. He can change things in your life. He can change the patterns, the statistics. You don't have to be one of the others that fall into the statistics of the world. You do not have to let the world form you into what they tell you you are. Amen. You need to let God tell you who you are. Amen. You are somebody. You are ahead and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. Yes. You can yes. mount up with wings as eagles is what the promise is. But how many of you know you can't do, you'll have to change some friends because you'll never do that hanging with turkeys. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to recognize who you hang with. Amen. Amen. Julie